Okay, welcome everyone and greetings to Bozeman, Montana. This is Paul Doherty here from the NAPSIG Foundation STAR Working Group. And it is about two o'clock here in New Zealand. Not sure what time it is there for all of you, but I think it's uh, time to get started. I have a lot to cover today, but I thought I could just start quickly with the, the goal of this presentation. And really what it's all about and what I was asked to do is to help bring together the geospatial or GIS professional community and the search and rescue community. And I wanted to do this by using some illustrations or examples and also an opportunity for you to get hands on with some tools you might not have used before. And I thought I'd actually start with telling a little bit, little story with maps. I was asked to present on a scenario in uh, Gallatin County, Montana. So the map you see here on my screen is Gallatin County. And the scenario is that a group of missing photographers were missing in the mountains north of Bozeman. On this map, you can see the initial planning point and situation report for this incident. A group of 10 photographers were dropped off by a helicopter on a ridge line in Montana. They had arranged to be picked up again when they were done with their photos. Before the helicopter could retrieve all the photographers, a severe storm rolled in, forcing the helicopter to ground. The photographers then called 911 from an old phone. The call came in to Gallatin County Dispatch in Bozeman to the west rather than the Park County Dispatch in Livingston to the east, which led everybody to initially think that they were, found, they were gonna be found on the west side of the mountain. If we look at some incident intelligence, we can see here that during the 911 calls, the photographers said with confidence that they were on the east side of the range in a bowl headed down to Ferry Lake. You can see Ferry Lake is east of the initial planning point or the place where they were last known to be. Then two cell phone pings or locations derived from cell phone indicated that they were southeast to east of the initial planning point. The storm broke long enough for another helicopter launch and when they flew over, they spotted the stranded photographers but had to wait to report their coordinates to the valley base due to high winds. Now let's break from our scenario for a second and talk a little bit about how GIS is used for search and rescue or can be used for search and rescue. The map you see here should be a familiar one if you're, if you're involved in search and rescue quite a bit and you use lost person behavior. This is a, uh, a statistical probability of area that indicates that each ring represents a 25% quartile of the distance between the point found and the initial planning point. In other words, 25% of all people are found within this distance of an initial planning point, according to a international search and rescue incident database. While this search operation did not likely require a great deal of search theory, spatial analyses such as multiple, multiple ring buffers, something you GIS professionals are familiar with, these can be useful job aids. And I like to refer to them as job aids, not predictive tools. So that's based off of statistics of previous incidents. We can also look at other models. And for those of you that do a lot of spatial analysis, you might recognize this as a cross-country mobility model. Here we see the distance that hikers could move within one hour, given the terrain, presence of trails, and presence of barriers. So we can see a half hour ring here, an hour ring there. And these are known as isochrones, and they just help us to kind of get an idea of uh, how far people can move throughout the landscape based off time and terrain. There are other models that are often used to look at probability of area or where people are likely to be. One of these is a track offset model. And here we're looking at things like trails and the distance from them. And 25% of the people are found within the red area or the closest area within trails. That's at least if we were expecting them to be sticking to trails. Next. We can look at areas where trails intersect stream crossings. These can often be challenging uh, environments for people, and they may not be able to uh, cross them. They can present barriers or even hazards. 
So we can see in the pink areas here, these are uh, places where trails intersect water. And then finally, spatial analysis such as cell phone models, uh, cell coverage areas based off of different towers might help us to narrow down our search area. But let's return to our scenario. Sometimes the missing pieces of information have nothing to do with complicated spatial analysis. It's just simple geospatial intelligence. We later discovered that when the helicopter crew reported the coordinates of photographers, their GPS had actually reverted back to the cell phone location they were given. In other words, they thought they were reporting where they were, where they saw people, but they actually were just using coordinates that had already been provided to them. Without knowing this error, they mistakenly confirmed the locations of the cell phone bids, putting more resources, or in this case, an assignment, putting ground teams east where the cell phone bids were in this little watershed here around Ferry Lake. Furthermore, they contacted forensic specialists at the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center. And these additional cell phone pings, in this case, suggested they were in another area. But finally, it's just good old fashioned common sense that I think helped the photographers survive this, this incident. The photographers began using their camera flashes. The ground teams on the east side of the ridge could see through the snow and clouds. And they could see those flashes. So this confirmed that they were on the wrong side of the mountain. A military ship from Great Falls located the subjects the next morning at this location. So it's actually southwest and more on the, east, the west side of the mountain range. Now, if we stop for a second and take a look at how data moves through a, uh, a search operation, in many cases, the data is static. In other words, it's reported over a radio, hopefully plotted on a map within an hour or so, and then more data is collected in this way. But more and more in areas of public safety, live data becomes really important. And so the app on the right here is something called the GeoForm, and it's just something that simply geo-enables uh, in intelligence data. So let's call this clue number 23 and the name of the reporting party. The object uh, found is a boot print, and we're not sure if it's relevant or not. And I'm going to plot this by hand rather than my location. I could, especially if I was using a smartphone, attach a photo to this point. But for now, I just want to be able to get it onto a map. So let's say that I'm at Bozeman Brewing Company. Looks like someone's already been there. And I'll submit this entry. Now this point goes into a database, but it's a geospatial database. And more importantly, it's live. And so this point that I just added will show up on a map anywhere that that map's being seen. There are lots of apps that can do this. This just happens to be called the GeoForm. But you can see here, my last point has been added to the map. And all of you at home watching can use this same app by, um, by going to this URL. Or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Can everyone still hear me okay and see my screen? Just let me know through the chat. Okay. So in conclusion, you know, this was a story that I told using something called a story map. And I think that maps can help us not just during incidents, but after incidents. What I want to share with you now are some resources that can help you begin to bring together geographic information systems with search and rescue. And probably the best place to start is this NAPSIG Foundation Carrot website. Here on this website, you can assess where your team is at using geospatial with search and rescue. And you can look at the scenarios here. Are you crawling with GIS, with GIS and search and rescue? Basically, our team can produce a basic search map and download some tracks and waypoints, but not a whole lot more, all the way out to running with GIS for search and rescue. We have someone on our team or someone we work with remotely that can analyze cell phone data, 
run cross-country mobility models, they can manage web mapping applications and share data, then I would say you're moving more into the running with GIS for search and rescue. If you click on these tools, on these uh, tabs at the bottom, you can go and find resources that help you in the beginner stage move into the walking stage or moving from walking into running. And that's just one free resource that's out there, and I'll provide the link through the chat. Now, another resource, if you're looking to get started right now, is something we used in our last Search and Rescue GIS workshop. This is called SAR GIS 8, and we held it in Washington, D.C. at USGS headquarters. We just used this story map to basically park our tutorials in a place where we could find them and look at interactive demonstrations like this one. So this is a map of Yosemite, and what you're seeing on the map is the distribution of incidents over 10 years of data. This could be a really useful preventative search and rescue tool. So not only do you get the example on the right, what you get on the left are tutorials that'll help you get started in creating maps just like this. I also put information in here for GIS professionals who maybe know how to uh, make a map, but they may not be that familiar with search and rescue. So for instance, here is a free training that introduces you to incident command system. Each of these tabs highlights a different topic, and I'll just walk through those topics briefly so you can get an idea of what uh, you have access to. The map to the right is something we call a PDF map or a GeoPDF. This means that it inherently has a location embedded inside of the file. But more importantly, this is a map that follows a standard, a standard that search and rescue teams should be aware of. You'll see here that it has a U.S. national grid, otherwise known as military grid reference system grid on it. It also has latitude and longitude. And U.S. national grid actually works with UTM. And you'll see that here in the, in the left side of the map. The small numbers represent the UTM grid. The large numbers are simply the U.S. national grid. Now, SAR teams are becoming more and more familiar with this because it's a standard for working on uh, nationally declared disaster operations, and many states are accepting this standard, especially for search and rescue operations. So what we did here in this tab is we made some resources available to you, uh, such as slides about applying U.S. National Grid for decision support, so how to use and read U.S. National Grid, and then we have an exercise for using this map and practicing your skills to, re to reinforce your training using U.S. National Grid. And then finally, there's more examples here, such as a map for mapping U.S. National Grid and also free training resources from the NAPSIG Foundation so that your team can get up and running communicating location. In this next tab, we talk a little bit more about field data collection. Now, field data collection traditionally in search and rescue is done using GPS units. And as a GIS professional, if you want to help a SAR team, you have to know how to work with GPS data. Luckily, this is getting easier and easier. And you can see in another example here, if I have a GPX file, the common file used in GPS units, if you send that to me via email, just with a simple web map, the same type of map that I used to make that story map, I can drag and drop and quickly take a look at these GPX files before, they, before I add them to my database. But more and more, as we uh, move into a world of smartphones, we're using apps. And there are a lot of apps out there that do things like live tracking, but I really wanna make sure that SAR teams are prepared to document the really important stuff, like where are their clues, so that no information flips through intelligence. And you can practice using that same geoform I showed you in the previous example. Again, there's more slides here on U.S. National Grid and, and using field uh, operations in search and rescue. Finally, at the bottom of that tab, there's tutorials for how to make this app you see here, the geoform. Next, if we move into the incident command post environment, I think it's really important for everyone involved in SAR 
to understand the types of map products that could be made for them. In other words, you shouldn't just be using one simple map for a search and rescue when you could be using geospatial intelligence tools. One of the simplest ones created by Eric Menendez of the SAR Working Group is the cellular GPS text tool. This is a tool that allows a SAR team to simply send a text to a, missing, to a person who's in distress, and it will retrieve their location and put it on a map. And I encourage you to test this out, because sometimes you have communication with a missing subject, uh, but you can't talk by phone, or they don't know exactly where they are, or they don't know how to give you coordinates. This will walk them through simply clicking on a text message and providing you a map of their location. But there's other tools on here as well, even simple PDF maps, but talking about some of the examples we showed you today, such as this uh, cross-country mobility model created using IGT for SAR. So IGT for SAR, or Integrated Geospatial Tools for Search and Rescue, for those of you that use ArcGIS, is simply an ArcGIS template that Don Ferguson of the ASRC created and what it does is it has tools that walk you through creating product, products like this. It's a PDF of subject mobility. I'll make sure that that download link's available to you through this presentation, but I encourage you to check it out if you're a GIS professional or to contact Don Ferguson directly to learn more about this. Now, it's important to be able to add points to the map, but it's also important to be able to track information. And this is something called the operations dashboard. All it does is allow me to pull in geographic information, but in an intelligent and really a metrics-driven way. So if I want to track the number of clues on my incident, or if I'm doing a post-event uh, damage assessment, the number of assessments, as people add new points to this database, it'll show up here in a simple number format. Or I can do things like see all of the unknown relevancy clues or relevant clues simply by interacting with these charts. So you can see here there's people entering data in from all around the world, but you can see the clues very clearly on the map. We can also do things like live tracking uh, using uh, something called Collector for ArcGIS. But what I'm really interested in is tracking my intelligence, and this operations dashboard is a nice way to do it. Looks like Curtis just uploaded a point from Bozeman, Montana. But for a lot of the SAR teams, just getting started, they might have to turn to tools that were designed just for them. And for that, I just wanted to brief you on a tool called SAR Topo, created by Matt Jacobs in California. What this is, is an app that is like the ArcGIS Online tools I've been showing you, but it's designed specifically for SAR teams that maybe don't have access to a GIS professional. Um, this is a tool that allows you to add layers to a map and simply start mapping by adding things like assignments and point last seen. I encourage you to contact Matt Jacobs directly. He's been really helpful to SAR teams in getting started with SAR Topo, and he provides this software free to SAR teams. There are also other tools you might already be using as a SAR team, such as uh, Turing Navigator Pro. And basically, whatever tool you're using for a hasty response, you just wanna make sure that you can get the data out or even better, connected to a GIS and a GIS professional's tools so that you can integrate uh, rapidly just in case you don't find that person within 24 hours and the incident gets larger and you have more needs for map products and spatial analysis. So don't think because you're not using GIS or a GIS professional that you're not using maps for SAR. We're also working on some prototypes so that IGT for SAR or MAP SAR uh, for ArcGIS desktop, we're moving some of those workflows into ArcGIS Online. And so now, using a simple web app, we're able to provide tools like quickly marking up an incident area with things like uh, where the person was last seen or clues or even plotting an incident command post. You shouldn't need a GIS professional to get mapping and starting to do that but I'd like to be able to connect to this data set in my GIS. And so this is part of something called ArcGIS Online. If we go over to Montana, 
we can see that same search operation that I added before, including the, the clues that are starting to show up on the map. So I encourage you to check out MapStar online. We're looking to, uh, to get this used more and more and get feedback. And if you're a developer or just a, uh, a GISer, you can learn more about MapStar online from our GitHub site. So we've mostly talked about using GIS during operation, but as our story map showed you before, it can also be useful after or before an operation. And one of the interesting ways I'm seeing GIS used here in New Zealand is for pre-planning. There's a very simple app for your smartphone called snap to map that allows you to make story maps just from photos on your phone. So most people have geo uh, tagging allowed on their phone, so every photo they take has a GPS coordinate. But rather than just plot it on a map, we can create interactive story maps like this one you see here. If I wanted to map out hazards or um, decision points in, a, in an area where I do a lot of searches, I could simply take some photos on my phone and use Snap to Map to create this interactive map tour. So you can see here the connection between the photo and the map. And you can even see this awesome picture of Mount Taranaki here in New Zealand on the west coast. It's literally a volcano that just rises out of the ocean. But probably a point that's often overlooked is the, the vast amount of data that's available to you, especially in the United States, that we would call base data. So up until now, we've mostly been talking about incident data data that you produce during an incident, but you often need more than just a base map to make decisions. You might have questions about where's the nearest uh, landing zone, or where's the nearest cell phone tower. This, is, this concept is known as having your minimum essential data set. And it's a really important concept, especially for you to work with your uh, GIS professional. Because the GIS professionals in your community, especially at the county and state level, they know where all the different data sets are, such as cellular antennas and radio repeaters and the types of vegetation and land boundaries and hazards such as mining. So coming from the wildland fire GIS community, we've adopted this in search and rescue. And it's a concept that's very important for you to understand. And you should have all of your base data with you locally on a hard drive before an incident even occurs. And more and more, you should have this stored in the web maps that you're going to be using for operation. So there's some examples in here on where to find uh, base data. You have a great one in Montana, but something that's available across all of the U.S. is something called the Highfeld Open Data Site. This is a data site where even if you're not a GIS professional, you can go in and explore the types of information that's been made available by the Department of Homeland Security. So for instance here, if I type in the word tower, it'll take me to anything that matches that keyword. And one of the most important ones now in search and rescue is cellular towers. You can see there, there's over 24,000 locations of cell towers. So even if you don't know your local GIS professional, and I encourage that you do get to know them, you can start here to begin to investigate all the different types of data that are available to you through ArcGIS Online and the Open Data Portal. So that takes us back to this, uh, to resources. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, for those of you that don't know, is an organization, a nonprofit, that helps connect GIS professionals with emergency managers and law enforcement and fire, but we're also looking to reach out to search and rescue communities, whether it's volunteer or a law enforcement uh, organization. And so what you see here is that same carrot capability readiness, capability and readiness assessment tool, but also how to get started with the software. If you're a search and rescue volunteer team, uh, as long as you're, you're affiliated as a true nonprofit, you qualify for the ESRI nonprofit program. You can also buy ArcGIS for personal use. 
There's also free developer accounts for people who are just prototyping and testing out workflows. And there's free ArcGIS accounts that you can use for some basic mapping and training. But the most important message, and most of the GIS professionals there in Bozeman know this, is that most government agencies already have access to the ArcGIS software. So please check with your IT or your GIS staff to find out more and see if you can get access before you even begin thinking about spending any money. As far as training goes, you've got some great uh, free resources here. I sent you through the, uh, the carrot page. Let me also send you this story map. And I encourage you to bookmark those. There's also free, a free ebook here called Using GIS for well, Wildland Search and Rescue, created by Vanessa Glenlinaris and George Durkee. And that just walks you through some of the basics of what is GIS and how can, it, how can I use it for search and rescue. And then finally, if you're a state or a county agency and you need more support, perhaps you have some GIS staff, but they just need a little help getting started with things like this. Uh, NASIG Foundation does offer services and we also host workshops around the country. So I encourage you to uh, send an email to service.gis.org and then check out this NAPSIG Foundation support brochure. Finally, if you need more resources, there's a few other places you can go. Um, as mentioned before, we have uh, a strong community growing in, in using GIS for search and rescue. And this is a blog that I manage where I put out little articles about resources that have been made available or events that have occurred around the world using GIS for search and rescue. And uh, this is a good place to start. If you wanna just stay in touch, you can follow this blog. Another way to get involved is to visit the SAR GIS discussion group. What this is is a Google uh, list where there's about uh, 700 members that are occasionally talk about things like GIS, microbreweries, uh, drones, mapping, and all things related to search and rescue. And this is another good place to get connected to the community. I'll post both of those links through the chat right now. But I thought we could wrap up today with another story. You might be interested in knowing, well, what search and rescue teams are actually starting to take their mapping to the next level. And uh, one of my favorite organizations is the Mountain Rescue Association, which is a nonprofit search and rescue organization that works across the United States. You can see here, they're using ArcGIS Online as a mapping portal. And the key workflow that they were interested in was collecting data from each of their volunteer teams. In the past, probably like most of you, after an incident uh, had occurred, someone fills out a paper form and puts it in a shoebox, or hopefully saves it as a Word document somewhere. And then at the end of the year, you tally up your reports, and then you know how many missions you've done and what types of missions. But the MRA, the only way they could handle this was to collect all those shoeboxes and then put them into a giant spreadsheet and GIS professionals, uh, I bet you're pretty familiar with the idea of being handed a giant spreadsheet and being asked to map it. Well, uh, the MRA wanted to do away with that workflow. They wanted it to be more interactive. And so each of these teams, there's more than 90 of them now, they log into their ArcGIS Online account and they use ArcGIS Online to collect data. So they do GIS, but I'm pretty sure that they don't even know that they're doing GIS. Here's what they're doing. They're filling out a simple geoform. Here's the mission data entry form for 2017, where they're entering their own unique mission number. They pick their team, the type of mission, and they fill out the various statistics that the MRA is interested in. But the most important thing is they have to put it on a map, whether they use UTM or US National Grid or Lat Long, or they just simply search for a place name. Or 
or if they happen to be out in the field, they can locate themselves. Ooh, I'm not in Napa, and I'm in Wellington. And when they're done, they can submit their mission entry. Once that goes into the, the database, it's immediately viewable, and it's viewable across a variety of apps. One of them is the simple edit missions app, which allows people to go back and edit missions in case they've got more information. It also allows them to do things like open up the table of all the missions and interactively work with the map and the table to better understand their data. If they'd like, they can filter by just their team or the map's extent, and then they can actually export all their data back to a spreadsheet if they're more comfortable working with the data the old-fashioned way. They can also print really simple maps, do things like change base maps. In ArcGIS Online, you have a wide variety of base maps you can use, including our traditional USGS topographic maps. So you don't have to go out and download USGS quad maps. They're all made available here, seamless. And they have access to any of the layers they'd like. Right now, they seem very interested in U.S. Forest Service GIS data, but we can add local data in here as well. When they're done entering missions, uh, they can go ahead and check out the 2017 dashboard. And this is a dashboard that's created for the entire MRA, so they can have a quick overview of what's going on across the entire organization. If they'd like, they can create their own local dashboards for their team. So you'll see here that it's loading up the MRA missions database. And in the background, it's going to fill out all of these widgets. We can take a look at the 2016 dashboard and get a better idea of what they've done over the course of an entire year. So you'll see here the most recent mission entered the mission count for 2016, the number of people rescued, but also other statistics like the most common types of missions and types of hikers that they rescue. They can also see and share the number of volunteer hours with their stakeholders. And of course, like any SAR organization, there's a little bit of competition to see who responds to the most rescues. So it looks like your neighbors down in the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group are quite active. We can also generate lost person behavior or missing person statistics by plotting not just the point where uh, someone went missing, but also where they were found to better understand uh, lost person behavior and generate more accurate statistics for local analysis. Finally, we can ask the map really simple questions like, I just want to know about my team. So I can see here there, we respond to 94 missions, and we generate over 1,000 volunteer hours over the course of a year. And we can look at historic data. So this is the third year of the project, and I'm really excited to see the types of spatial analyses we can generate. For instance, in 2015, we looked at the average response area for a SAR team by connecting all the dots around their response area and the average was about 7,000 square miles. So the MRA has mostly, at this point, been using this just for simple data collection after an incident. Over time, we've introduced more capabilities into their mapping platform, such as the ability to actually respond to missions using ArcGIS Online and simple apps like the GeoForum. But we wanted to be really open about what we're doing with the rest of the search and rescue community. 
And so we've made a series of tutorials available so you can see what capabilities are enabled by this mapping platform. And you can access that through the link here. Finally, if you're a search and rescue team and you'd really like to do something similar, we've also made the mission data schema open source. So you can go to our open data portal and you can actually look at the way we're collecting our data. Or if you want, you can download the layer of membership teams if you want to see where, if you want to be able to plot the locations of MRA teams in your area. Here's the mission data schema. You can see how the data is collected. And if you'd like, you can download it as a spreadsheet, KML, shapefile, or file geodatabase for you search and rescue people, uh, your GIS people. So it looks like we're getting closer to the end of the hour and I wanted to leave time for a question and answer. Why don't we go back to our training map, our training story map, and just quickly review. This, story, this training story map will walk you through the basics of GIS and STAR with lots of clickable links and things that you can go do on your own. It also walks through field operation, uh, GIS and the instant command pose, using GIS to collaborate between teams, uh, one of my favorite topics, pre-planning and preventative search and rescue, and then where to go next. So I think this is a good resource that you should bookmark, and we'll be updating it as we learn more best practices and when we host our next search and rescue GIS workshop event, which, by the way, we usually host in November, and we still haven't decided on a location. So if you're interested in hosting this, we're looking for a home somewhere in the Rocky Mountain area. It'll probably be Denver, but we're open to new ideas. And again, that's usually the first or second week in November, and uh, that's not actually all that far away. So I'd actually like to open it up to questions. I'm not positive that uh, anybody has sent any in through the chat. But what I will do is make sure that uh, Bozeman is unmuted. And if you're able to uh, unmute yourself, we can uh, maybe have a little bit of Q&A. All right, we're unmuted. Oh, great. How's the weather in Zealand? Would you like to cover where it's snowing right now? <laughs> well, uh, Wellington's actually been a really, really wet uh, summer, but I was just up in another area of New Zealand called Hawke's Bay, and uh, it was a, a lot warmer there than, than Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> Just saying, we probably have a bed and a computer for you to work on. <laughs> so um, I had a quick question for all of you. Um, I think I, I did ask Curtis this, but have, have any of you, either jazz professionals or search and rescue teams, have you heard of or started using U.S. National Grid? No. Heard of, not using. I think it's a good idea to look over the tutorials. Um, I traditionally used UTM when I was a ranger in Yosemite, and it's very, very similar. Uh, but I do think it lends itself to being really clear for communication because uh, the zone and the, um, the grid zone designation, all of that gets indicated in the, in the actual uh, coordinate string. So it makes it very hard to screw up. And the other reason is uh, if you're working on things like uh, large floods, like we had the Colorado flood, if you're working with FEMA teams or USAR teams, they're all going to be using that uh, coordinate notation. So it's, it's good to at least be familiar with. But like I said, on that, um, in this training story map, we've got resources there for you to, to get started learning. Are any of the apps that you had mentioned actually accepting the data information from the Garmin rhinos that are transmitting their polling locations? That's a good question. So the question was, um, are any of the apps I showed, will they pull in 
radio location through the Garmin Rhino. And I think of the apps I showed, I can think of some creative ways to pull it onto a web map, but where I have seen it used is more on the desktop side of GIS. So if you can get a live uh, GPS um, signal into either ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro, then you'd be able to pull that into the, the desktop application. I didn't want to show too much of that because it's a more complicated uh, tool, but the uh, short answer is yes. The long answer is depends on how you want to do it. Thank you. I have a follow-up question to the lost first behavior. I've heard that they're trying to adapt mountainous terrain to lost person behavior, in particular people are tend to be down in drainages. Do you know of any mapping tools that kind of incorporate that? Yeah, so a good place to start would be um, IGT for SAR, which is uh, the application I referenced before. And it is a GIS tool. Um, however, we're moving that to be more of a, um, a lighter application that wouldn't be overwhelming for a, a non-GIS professional. But if you're a GIS professional, you can go to uh, IGT for SAR, or it's called MapSAR X, um, and it's on GitHub, and you can download it, but I encourage you to email Don Ferguson directly, and that's got a lot of different tools for mapping terrain. Um, all you have to do is provide the base data, and then it'll run the, the models. But it brings up a good point of um, lost person behavior used to be all about the book that Robert produced, Robert Kester, but more and more he's working with GIS tools to make uh, his book come to life so that if you plot where a person was last seen, it would return these results to help you. But I'm not sure when uh, his project will be fully launched. Okay, thank you. One of the, uh, one of the things we found, and I, I did talk about it briefly in here, is um, one of the best data sets to use so that you don't even have to run an analysis is probably one that every uh, GIS professional has access to, and it's the watershed database uh, for the United States. And you might have smaller ones for your search area, but basically watersheds become really valuable planning delineation areas because they highlight ridge lines and drainages. So for instance, this is a really large watershed. I think in the hydrological data set, there's a step down from this. And you can use those as rough planning areas to more or less say, uh, I think this would be a, a reasonable assignment area or an assignment area I can chop in half. And so uh, even without doing spatial analysis, the base data can help you with uh, that sort of terrain mapping. Anyone else? I think I saw some. Go ahead. Oh, um, I'll get to this one in the chat menu after uh, your question. What was your question over there in Bozeman? So how do I, we'll do some social engineering here. How do I get my yeah. GIS professionals, and I'm looking at a couple of them, hooked up with my operations and planning people, and my comms people, what, what do I need to get for them, for the GIS people here in my, uh, my operations base to make it all Hold on, I'll show, I'll show you uh, an example here in just a moment of how to do that. Um, I have a very valuable database which works well on GIS professionals. And it's a map of all the microbreweries in North America. And what I highly suggest is you, you know, have a, a beer or a coffee with your county GIS professional to start. And well, I think if you just show them what, <laughs> what was that? Oh. <laughs> Uh, I'm only half joking, but I think, um, and I could probably use some help updating this from 2015, but I think um, one of the most important things is to just let the GIS people know what you're trying to do. Uh, a lot of times you're just saying, you know, I wish 
are, and this may not be you, but a lot of teams say, I wish the topo maps had the latest trail data. And the topo maps may not, but they might have that data set available and they might be working on it right now. And so you can work with them just in the simplest way on getting, uh, building out your minimum essential data set. Um, so I think the MED or the base data set is the best place to start because it's the easiest way for them to help you is just show you where things are. Um, but then the second part is, you know, maybe get them out on a search operation training or something where you can show them your, your workflows. Um, because frankly, you know, most of us GIS professionals got into the field because we thought we'd be like working outside and mapping mountains and other things. But uh, the reality is most GIS professionals get stuck in a back office somewhere mapping parcels when, you know, I'm sure they would love to be able to help uh, save a life or help protect, you know, SAR responders. So I think SAR with base data and then maybe show them, show them what SAR really is. Um, did that answer your question, or was it direct enough? Or yeah, you were you were fine. It was it was mostly rhetorical. They're all sitting in the same room. We just can't seem to make the <laughs> make the hard switch over because we're doing a little bit evolution, not necessarily revolution here. Right. And trying to get some of my the stuff we're used to using and get make them switch. And those are hard. The switch is the hard. Yeah, I think um, the NAPSIG Foundation has a lot of experience with this, and we have a search and rescue working group, um, which I'm the chair of. And basically, you know, every public safety sector has gone through this, as you called it, evolution. You know, it started with wildland fire, and then it probably moved to structural fire, and then it moved into law enforcement because we're a little bit slower, and then it moved into emergency management because there's now, you know, more funding since Katrina and 9-11. And then I think search and rescue is the next logical place to see a lot of this tight-knit growth. The biggest challenge is that search and rescue teams themselves tend to be volunteers. And uh, there's no, I don't know of many people in the country who have search and rescue and GIS in their title. But I do know a lot of people who have emergency management and GIS in their title. And those would be the logical people to start with. Um, not sure if you have that in, in Montana State um, but you might in the next state over, and it might be uh, a good time to host a, a local event to kind of bring the public safety GIS people who are already interested in that type of work into your search and rescue community. Um, just because I know the people on our chat uh, can't speak up, uh, we have a question from Michael, and he said, are most of the applications built off the shelf with Esri Solutions, or was there a significant amount of customization that needed to be done? So I'll interpret uh, customization as like coding and development, and uh, the answer is none of that, because I don't, I'm not a developer myself. Um, some of the people on the team are, like Don Ferguson, who is putting together the, the desktop tools. But everything I've shown today is either a story map or a web app. And the way those all work is based off of a, um, you basically start with a simple web map and you build your applications from there. And so uh, why don't I pull up a quick web map here just to show you um, roughly where, where to start. So this is just a simple web map, and let's say uh, I'm in the MRA site and I want to map out my MRA teams. And I want it to be public. I already have a public layer for that. And let's say I want to uh, add something interesting like uh, land ownership. Uh, let me just put land in there. This is called the Living Atlas. Uh, I can add things like elevation. Or maybe I can look for federal land. So 
So now I can make a really simple map of where there's MRA members uh, overlaid with federal land. And if I want to, uh, if I have a, a mission map that's publicly available, I can add my missions. I can save this map and I can use it a, <clears throat> a whole bunch of different ways. But the web map, as you'll see, already has too many tools for, let's say, uh, if I wanted to send this to my mom, she would be super overwhelmed with all these tools. So what we do is we go from a web map into web mapping applications. And so apps are just really simple ways to make my, my web map more focused. So if I want, if I, this is a public map, I could simply embed it in a website. That's one way to make it really um, uh, simple. Or I can create a focused app. So one that I like to use is the public information app. But what I showed you before, what I used to present from, was called a, a uh, story map journal. So basically, each of these apps has like a builder interface. And I'll show you what I mean. So I'm not doing any programming. It's really a matter of just knowing what's there, like knowing what's available. Now, this web map, I can go back and make changes to it. I can add new layers. I can change the base map. I can do an analysis and put it on that map. All of that gets saved in the web map and is shared anywhere else that it's being viewed. That could be on a mobile device, like using apps on the, on the phone. There's several. There's Explorer for ArcGIS. There's Collector for ArcGIS. They're all focused apps for uh, mobile devices. But for this one, I might just want to make a really simple interface that just has a legend, a little about page with some information, and the ability to turn layers on and off, I can launch that, and now I've made my app. I can go back and do some configuration, but all of this was being done just using a builder. So if you've ever had a blog, or even if you use, I would say, Facebook, um, it's about as simple to use as that. And this is my new app. So that web map, I just made it a little bit simpler and easier to use. And what we've provided on that training uh, story map is links to tutorials on how to do all these things. So for instance, that um, the GeoForm has a tutorial. Um, This one, the Clue Log Spatial Lab, is the one the jazz professional would probably want to download because it works from scratch. Or you can just use the Create a Clue Log, which all you need for that is, is ArcGIS Online. Um, now, if you're looking for an operational layer um, that you can use to get started that has most of the things you're looking for in a search and rescue environment, then you just go to MAPSAR Online. And if you're already using ArcGIS Online, this will be really simple for you. But what I've done is made the URL for the feature layer, the layer that has all the SAR stuff, available so that you can just publish it from your ArcGIS Online account. So, and I'll just show you quickly how, how that works. Sorry for those of you that are uh, not interested in the GIS part of this, but I wanted to show it so everybody can see that it's not that hard. So for instance, now that I have that URL, what that is is like a, <clears throat> a schema, or just basically is the way the database is structured and the way the symbols look. And I can create that in my own organization from scratch. So I don't want any of the data, I just want that really cool MapStar online uh, data model and I'm going to publish a new layer 
that allows me to um, <coughs> begin mapping. So that'll just publish a new layer. So you'll notice I'm doing a lot of this without ever going into ArcGIS Desktop or ArcGIS Pro. I mostly use those tools now for the analysis or the management of data, <clears throat> but for most of my mapping, I do that online so I can share it with anybody that I need to, and, and so it's live. So now you'll see I have the, the layers with no data, but it's ready to begin just editing. So I can begin <clears throat> marking up the map with the last known point or roadblocks or assignment areas, whatever it may be. This is the same data model we used in MAPSAR desktop, except for now it's published online. And to be honest, it has more layers than you'll probably ever use, and so we're working on making this more simple. But the more people that use this data model, the more feedback I'll get, the more it'll, it'll meet your needs. So I encourage GIS professionals who are working with SAR teams to go ahead and, and try out MAPSAR online. Question. Yep. Is there any easy way to do a map data dump onto SD cards for use in the individual GPS units? So for the planning department to basically say, you know, these are your areas for tomorrow, here you go, the night before, and just hand out the SD cards? Is that integrated? Yep, and um, that's, yep, and that's what um, Don Ferguson has done with IGT for SAR and John Petter for MAPSAR. But even for the JS professionals who are just using their, their normal tools, all you would do is, um, let's see, I don't have any uh, tracks in here, but I just have some points. This point layer, I would want to create into the file format that GPS uses. So I can actually export this as GPX, um, or I can export it as KML, whichever one works better for uh, those, and I would just put those onto SD cards, um, maybe with, in a little baggie with, you know, assignment one, assignment two, assignment three. Um, I'd also give them a paper map. I'd also give them an online map or whatever is going to work in your environment. But it is really helpful to have those things just loaded onto your GPSs. Um, more and more, I'm seeing the use of <clears throat> mobile apps, not just mobile apps that work with ArcGIS Online, but mobile apps. Uh, what do I use? GPS tracker, I think. Uh, let me just see what I use on my phone. I forgot to set up my phone for uh, demo, but uh, I use my tracks on iPhone. And what this means is someone could <clears throat> email me a GPX file created in, you know, any GIS software, and I can add it to my, <clears throat> my tracks, and it will show up on my map. And then this way, I don't even have to deal with cables or SD cards or anything. It could just be done, um, you know, via email if that's an option. And most of these apps will work without a cell phone connection because there's a native GPS on board inside of your uh, device. So those are, you know, just other creative solutions if you're looking to get up and running. To go off of that, I have a question about um, live tracking your field assets. Uh, have, are there any good options that you know have been implemented to track um, uh, uh, search and rescue members or, um, you know, even trucks, whatnot, um, in areas with low connectivity? So uh, what I'm seeing in the urban search and rescue space is collector for ArcGIS. And the way this works is um, you can collect data in the field. If you're going to go offline, you cache your map, 
you collect your data, and then as soon as you come back online, it'll sync up with the rest of the operation <clears throat> and all your maps. If you're not working online at all, in other words, even your command post is disconnected, I know with Android and I believe iPhone as well now, you can sort of what we call sideload. So you can connect to a computer and swap files that way um, while still using the app on your, on your phone. Uh, now that's using cellular devices. There's lots of apps out there and I listed them on the training that will do things with, with radios. Um, there's also, uh, I believe the one they're using commonly here in New Zealand is called SARTRAC. Uh, which works over radio. Um, but, you know, what I'm seeing things move more towards is things like collector for ArcGIS and uh, workforce for ArcGIS. And those are we, all just a uh, part of uh, ArcGIS Online. We've been looking into using collector for ArcGIS for our, for our road and bridge department, and that's one of the hurdles um, that they have is, sure, you can, you can, you know, check out the data, and then when they get back into the office, they can they can um, merge it back. But as far as having information live, um, that doesn't cut it. But there are options for transmitting over radios. Yeah, I've seen um, Eden Kane, who's actually from New Zealand, uh, he used uh, Infinity mics and ArcGIS. Um, and I think this still works with ArcMap. Uh, in other words, uh, you attach a GPS unit or a GPS mic to your radio, and every time you key the radio, it gives a, a location. And really, you know, think about the workflows where you need this. It's really those high-risk scenarios where you need to know where everyone is at every time. Maybe that's not always what's needed in a search operation, um, because if you don't manage the data well, then it becomes overwhelming. Um, and you don't want to spend time configuring, you know, live tracking stuff if it's gonna slow you down in the, in the actual operation. So um, I did put some more information in there in the, in the, story, uh, the story training map, but I do notice on my end at least, it's two, hour, two minutes past the hour. What I'd like to do is just close the recorder and uh, say goodbye to our remote attendees, but I'll leave the webcast open for a few minutes so we can wrap up. So for everyone else, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I've posted some links, and for those of you on the NAPSIG list, uh, we'll send out a follow-up email. But the main place to get started is just with this um, SARJS 8 basic training story map. That's where most of the links and resources I provided are made available. So I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recorder now. <laughs>